Oh, well, why don't we just stand uh, and just pray briefly, and then we're going to get right into our message this morning as we're talking about Pentecost today. So, Father, we just come before you right now. We thank you, Father, that we would have ears to hear and what the Spirit is saying to our hearts today. God, I just pray for just a time of refreshing in your presence, God, that, Father, we would leave differently than we came in. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God is good. We serve a really good God. So, I want to talk about the first Pentecost, um, obviously, um, after the cross, because we understand that um, we can go all the way back into the Old Testament, but we're going to start right after the cross, okay? And uh, to understand, first, first and foremost, that the first Pentecost, um, it really is a celebration of the Spirit's power being released on the church, all right? And... Um, the word Pentecost actually comes, it's actually Greek, but the actual Hebrew word is Shavat, which really talks about the, the, the Feast of Weeks. And this is really a time of celebration. It's the harvest celebration. And they would offer their first fruits unto the Lord, and it was a celebration of the harvest that took place. And so they celebrated that um, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. Amen? Passover happens, then there was the resurrection Fifty days later, seven weeks later, we have the Spirit of God, the power of God being poured out on the church. Okay? It's uh, Shavat or Pentecost is double significant. It marks the all-important wheat harvest, which I just mentioned. Say wheat harvest. Okay? But it also, uh, uh, it actually celebrates the anniversary that God gave the Torah to the entire nation of Israel. All right? So God gave the law and the Torah to the entire nation of Israel. That was assembled at Mount Sinai, um, and, and it's kind of symbolic of that. On Passover, the people of Israel were freed from their enslavement to Pharaoh. On Shabbat, they were given the Torah and became a nation committed to serving God. All right? And so it's the same way when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. You know what? We were, we were given life. Amen? We were freed from the power of the devil. We were freed from the power of the world. Now we can enter into new, newness of life. We can become believers. The Spirit of God can take residence within us. But then 50 days later, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. All right? And so after a period of time coming out of Egypt, we can't prove it that it was exactly seven weeks, but the Torah was given and they celebrated that, that they received the law. Amen? In Matthew chapter 3, I want to read this. It's very important. Okay? I want you to say this. Say, Pentecost talks about the harvest. And I love the Word of God because it's, there's so many nuggets of truth and, and it's just, it's put together so beautifully that there's no way anyone could have put it together so accurately. Would you agree with me? We see Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12 says this. I baptize with water. This is John the Baptist speaking. All right. And those who uh, repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. Okay. I'm not even worthy to, to tie his sandals is what John the Baptist is saying. All right. I'm not even worthy to be a slave to, to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now we talked about this last week. How many remember? A few weeks ago. John the, Baptist, John the Baptist came baptizing in water unto repentance, but Jesus was going to come and fully immerse us with the Holy Spirit and fire, right? I want us to read on here. Next verse, verse 12. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork, and then he will cleanse up the threshing area, gather the wheat into the barns, but burning the chaff with unending fire. And I love this because it's almost prophetic, it's a prophetic timeline where he's saying, here, listen, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize and fully immerse the church with the Holy Spirit and it's going to be harvest time. And we see that this is exactly what happened because they were celebrating the harvest. And the Holy Spirit came to bring, we're talking about a spiritual significance, bring a harvest of souls into the kingdom during the celebration of the harvest. Isn't that awesome? It gives us a prophetic timeline that the Holy Spirit's coming. He's coming and he's going to come. And when he comes, it's going to be harvest time. That's awesome. And it says the purpose of, of the power of the Holy Spirit is for harvest. Can you say that with me? Say the purpose of the power is for harvest. That's what the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is for, is to bring in harvest. 
And we also see the timeline in this passage, which is, which is really cool to me. In John chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so Israel had to celebrate the law that was given to them, that was going to guide them, that was going to direct them into a, some type of relationship with God. But the, but the spirit, say the spirit of grace and truth was released in the harvest time. Isn't that awesome? That we're no longer bound to live and to strive after fulfilling the law because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. And you know what? As Christians, you know, we can fall into that trap. You know. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you know, you search the scriptures for in them you, you think you're going to find everlasting life. Didn't he say that? And, you know, we can do that as Christians. We're searching the scripture for the next nugget of truth. saying, you know, I just, I just got to find more truth. And, and it's good to do that. But Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you know, but the scriptures are talking about me. If you can see Jesus in the scripture, if they, if they don't testify of Jesus and grace and truth and power, you're missing the mark. And you're striving. Do you know what my striving is? My striving is, and I try to keep it that way, and I fail sometimes, is to enter into rest. That's what God wants us to do. Strive to enter into that place of rest where the spirit of grace moves through you and you're in relationship with God and everything flows. And you can say like Job, my feet were bathed with butter. And everywhere I went, it was just easy street. My children praised me. And those, when I stood in the marketplace and I, if I made a sarcastic joke, people would say, no, no, he's, he's lying. He's not, no, he's kidding around. Because they knew his character. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? And so we want to, we want to, um, to understand that the purpose is for power. Amen? And the power is the grace and the truth that came through Jesus Christ. How many need grace and truth? I mean, I need it. I need it every day. Now, let's look at John chapter 20, verse 21 to 22. And again, he said, peace be with you. Now, Jesus had already risen from the dead, and he was hanging out for 40 days with the disciples. Okay? But this is actually Easter. Okay? This is, he, he rose from the dead. He meets with the disciples. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Next verse. And then he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. <sighs> And he released the Spirit of God on them. This was the point of salvation. And some people will actually teach that the, the beginning of the church, the beginning of the new birth was on the day of Pentecost. But if Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, guess what they received? The Holy Spirit. It's very important to understand this because that was promised in John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. God breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another verse here together. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Luke 24, 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit. So now let us read this carefully. And in a little while, I will send the Holy Spirit. Is that what he's saying? Jesus is meeting with his disciples before he's going back to the Father. He says, and now, what does now mean? It means now. And I don't understand why people can't just read the scripture and take it for face value without going to some seminary, I mean, cemetery, I mean, whatever you call it, to learn what the scriptures are saying. It's so clear. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. And I believe in Luke, and John has given the other interpretation. He's given a little, he's saying, and then he breathed on them. We don't hear Luke tell us that. Just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. This is important. We have to understand that the Spirit's work in a believer's life is twofold. Say twofold. Number one is for regeneration. So to regenerate you and make you a new person creature in Christ. But the second reason is for empowerment. And some denominations get this wrong. And I really feel like it's important that we understand the moment someone accepts the Lord, the spirit of God comes and takes up residence and you become a new creature. Amen. 
But then there's a second stage, and it's, it's called empowerment for the work of the ministry. And God wants us to be empowered to do the work of the ministry. You say, well, pastor, I'm not a preacher. No, but you have the work of the ministry to do in your family. You have the work of the ministry to do in your relationships. You have crazy, chaotic people you have to work with, and you need empowerment. Amen? Some of you agree? So Jesus was teaching his disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended. Um, and this is what he did in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. If I could get just one of the ushers to bring me just a little bit of water, that'd be great. Appreciate that. Look what he says, and it says here, and being assembled together with them. Now, so he's with his disciples. He commanded them. Say commanded. This is not a suggestion. This isn't, well, if you really want to, you can do it. I don't care if you don't do it, but I would suggest that you do it. It'll be to your benefit. No, he didn't say that. He said, I command you not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. He's telling them to wait, and it's a command. And I guess my question this morning is, if he's telling the, the disciples, the ones who walked and talked with him and had really knew him, and he commanded them to wait, why in the world don't we take time to wait? You know, there's certain groups of Christians out there that believe that the power, of, the power of God, the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, all of that stuff passed away with the disciples. Hey, listen, we need it more than they did. We're still living in a messed up, chaotic world. And if they needed it, we need it. Amen? So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. There's nowhere in the Scripture that it says the power left. It's a command. Wait upon the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Acts chapter 1, verse 5 He's telling them, wait, it's a command, and he's waiting for what? A promise. So the command is, wait for the promise which the Father gave you. And this is the promise, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he's saying to his disciples, listen guys, you've, guys, you've got the breath of God in you, you're saved. But not many days from now, you're going to be fully immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit for the work of the ministry. That's what he's saying. There's only one way to read this thing. So let's, let's focus for a minute on, on the command to wait. The word wait means to actually to stay around in a given place, in a given state, in a given expectancy. God wants us to, to, to wait, and waiting is not something that's passive. You don't, waiting doesn't mean you just stand there and think about nothing. Well, I hope God shows up soon and does something. My marriage is falling apart, or my finances are gone, or you know, I'm struggling with, and God, I need you. Come and show up. That's not what waiting is. Because when he commanded the disciples to wait, he said, wait for the promise. And so when you wait on God, you're holding the word of God and say, God, I'm holding fast because your word declares. And I, and I trust you. And you're going to show up. And when you show up, I, and, I, and I don't care if it takes 10 years, I'm, I'm waiting because, God, you said. And there's an expectancy in your spirit for the manifestation of what God promised. And, you know, a lot of times you go and you go to soaking meetings and they're fun because the presence of God is amazing. And you can sit there and everyone just sits there and enjoys the presence of God. And that's great. But you know what? There's a different type of waiting. And it's, it's going before God and just saying, God, I'm holding fast to the promise until I see the fruition. Amen? Say, so i got to wait with expectancy. And, and let's see what happened here. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we'll go to that passage. It says, and they continued with one focus in prayer. What do you think they were focused on? What would you be focused on? Like, okay, pretend you're the disciples now. Jesus just told you, okay? I think it was 10 days earlier. Listen, God's going to send the Holy Spirit, and there's going to be like an immersion of power. 
So they're waiting in Jerusalem. What do you think they're waiting for? They're waiting for the Holy Spirit. So they have, look what it says right here. They continue with one focus. God, you're sending the promise. We're waiting for the promise. We're waiting for the promise. And waiting always includes the purpose and the prayer. It's not just sitting in the prayer closet. It is prayer fully expecting the fulfillment of the promise. And um, here's the question. Why should we wait? The next scripture tells us in Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will rise up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We have to learn to wait on God. I have to, you know, I was preparing this message and the Lord was rebuking me through the whole thing. Not in a loving, fatherly way saying, son, you know, you need to come back to waiting yourself. Because we can get so busy that we don't know how to wait anymore. Amen? So how do we wait? So how do we wait? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a formula to power. How would you like that? Okay? Because I see it in the word of God. God just says, I was preparing this message. God opened it up and I was like, wow. I mean, I was just in repentance. As God began to show me um, the process to power, not the formula, the process that we need to take for the power of God to come. Do you guys want to know that? So looks, how do we wait? Number one, we isolate. We isolate. So we're going to use the word isolation. This is important. And we live in a generation at a time where people don't know how to isolate themselves with God in the secret place. And Jesus said, when you're in the secret place, right, there's a time of spending alone time with God and, and, and we get away from it because of the busyness of life. I do. I don't know about you guys. Because I get so busy sometimes that I don't take the time I need to isolate myself with God. Amen. We see Jesus actually teaches us this. Um, in his own life. If you go with me to Luke chapter 5. Verse um, 15 to 16. It says, however, the report went about concerning him, being Jesus. All the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Now stop there. So you got multitudes of people coming and saying, we, Jesus, we heard you can heal. We, we, hear, we hear you have miraculous power. Can you minister to us? And he's being surrounded. And what does Jesus do? Next verse tells us here. The next verse, verse 16. So he himself often withdrew. Say often. Withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Because he needed a top up. And if we, don't, if we don't have isolation in a wilderness place, and that doesn't mean a dark place. That just means in a place where we're alone. This is my throne time with God. If it has to be on the toilet, I don't care. Find time where you can be alone and isolate yourself with the Father and talk to the Father. And you know what happens? The Holy Spirit begins to empower you. The Spirit's power begins to flow in the place of isolation. Is this making sense to you guys? All right. When power is needed to overcome, we need to withdraw ourselves to secluded prayer. I have a, a quote here by George Whitfield. We can bring that up. George Whitfield was responsible, one of the men who were responsible for the Great Awakening. In England and in North America, South America, there was a move of God that took place in the late 1700s. And this is... The quote. Can we bring that up, boys? No? Okay, I'll read it as you try to get it. George Whitfield said, Believers keep up and maintain their walk with God by secret prayer. The spirit of grace is always accompanied with the spirit of supplication. It's the very breath of the new creature, the fan of divine life, whereby the spark of holy fire kindled in the soul by God is not only kept but raised into a flame. And so if Jesus needed isolation away with the Father, how much more do we need it? Amen? And we can get so busy that we move away from time with God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Mark 1, 35, it says, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. God, help us to learn to isolate ourselves. 
in a, in, in, in a busy culture that demands us to be here and there and everywhere, and we don't take time to pray. And I'm guilty as well. But if we would learn to isolate, there's something powerful that's going to take place in, in our lives, all right? So, the busier you get, the more you need secret prayer, all right? I think we're probably having problems with the quotes, right? Can you not get them up? If you can't get them up, I'm just going to read them and get them to you later, all right? This is what Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, said. He said, I have so much to do today that I'll spend the first three hours in prayer. There's William Booth's quote. Awesome. But Martin Luther said, I have so much to do today that I'll spend the first three hours in prayer. I mean, that means like, listen, if you spend time in prayer, God will multiply your time. and He'll make it, everything go smoother. Amen? And when I read that quote, I thought, oh, God, I'm kind of doing things wrong. And we have to be the first to admit, hey, listen, I can fine-tune my life a bit, right? Here's another one here. Um, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. How many remember I spoke of John Wesley? It says, John Wesley would rise up at 4 a.m. every day to seek God for the first four hours of the day. In his later years, Wesley was known to spend up to eight hours in prayer every day. And that, this, is, this is a key that, you know, you might not have four hours to pray, but take some time. Start somewhere. Say, God, I'm going to isolate myself away so that you can pray. Is that good? Now, here's General Booth. How many would like to hear um, what G G General Bru Booth said? In the mid-1800s, and he's the founder of the Salvation Army, for those of you who don't know. Um, powerful, powerful revival. One of these days, I used to teach revival history. One of these days, I'll take the time and I'll actually teach uh, through some of these revivalists, because they had powerful lives, and they did great things for God. But William Booth said this, he said, in the, in the mid-1800s, one of the most effective weapons of General Booth's arsenal was fervent prayer. Okay? It was not unusual for Booth to hold an all-night prayer meeting. When he came to preach the Word of God, people would, would flood the altars everywhere as he went. The power of God was wonderfully manifest in the meetings. People were frequently struck down and overwhelmed with the sense of the presence and power of God. The Salvation Army's success at freeing the captives was, was uncanny, especially when one considered those who it served to reach. General Booth's battle cry was, go for souls and go for the worst. The worst of sinners were saved, saloons were closed, entire cities were, were shaken by God's power. Booth's success attracted not only supporters, but also enemies. Those who served in the army were pelted with hot coals, sprayed with tar and burning sulfur, beat, stoned, and even kicked to death in the streets. We, we, we complain because people say, well, you know, we, we don't know what persecution is. They, they knew what it was. The Salvation's army resisted their enemies with a cheerful God bless you and a prayer. General Booth himself was often in the thick of it. And when spit on during the Midlands tours, Booth encouraged his fellow soldier, don't rub it off. It's a medal. These men, <laughs> this is amazing. And I think that if we, if we, it's very important that we don't forget our foundations, that, we, that there's ancient foundations. We have to look back at moves of God before us and, and the way that was paved for us. And we've got to say, you know what, I'm going to stand with them. I'm not going to compromise because they fought to keep truth. So I'm going to fight alongside. Because we have a great army in heaven, a great cloud of witnesses that are looking over the balcony of heaven and saying, come on, fight on. Don't back down. Don't compromise because you're standing up for truth and, you know, you're offending somebody because you're talking about gender identity or something like, you know, or any, any, any case, because we live in a very liberal society. And they're standing around and saying, no, stand for it. Stand for truth. Stand for truth. Amen. These were just some prayer quotes from the 17 and 1800s of the few that I did here. And what I found from studying the past revivals, I found crazy, isolated prayer times. I mean, people would pray. These pastors would pray 15, 16 hours a day before they'd get up to preach. And then you wonder why they had revival. George Whitfield was a great evangelist that went all over the world. He preached in fields and crowds of 100,000 people would come to listen to him preach. And he didn't need a mic and he could speak to 100,000 people because God supernaturally touched his voice. And this is what it says about his prayer life. Go to the next one. Oh, I may, maybe I didn't give you that one. Um, it says here, 
Uh, he says, whole days and weeks I have spent prostate on the ground in silent and vocal prayer. Whole days and weeks he would stay on the face saying, God, I'm not moving till you bless my nation. Waiting on God for the promise of the Father. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Do you know when I was teaching this in Bible school, I had a student, and um, is Allison here today? She's upstairs. She would know who I'm talking about. There was a guy, his name was Jermaine, and uh, he was single, and he was about, at the time, maybe 21. And so he had lots of time on his hands. How many know some of us don't have as much time? And I was teaching about revival. I was talking about these great men of God who went before us and how they spent time, hours, weeks in prayer until the power of God came. And, and, I, I was, and he was getting all excited. And he came up to me after. He goes, if God will do it for them, he'll do it for me. I got all kinds of time. And so he, 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 so he went in his room and he locked himself in a room. I can't remember how many days. And he just sought God and sought God and sought God and sought God and, sought God and, and just prayed and prayed. And all of a sudden, he had a, a revelation he heard the audible voice of God. He said, he heard God say, I love you, son. Something about that, like that. And it so transformed him that he came out of there and he started witnessing on the streets. And the power of God would come upon people. He went to the beach and he would go out and he'd start telling people about Jesus. And when he waved his hand, they'd all go, boom, 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 boom. And they'd all fall under the power of God on the beach. And he was so overwhelmed with the the, the baptism, the full immersion of God's spirit, I, I remember. And he was telling me all the stories. Yeah, I was talking to this person on the street. God touched him right in the middle of Walmart. And he's giving me all these stories, right? And they're crazy stories. I said, well, why don't you come talk to the youth? Because Camilla and I were running the youth ministry at the time. So he came out. and We, we, had, the, there was, we had about 20, 25 kids at the time. And they all invited their friends. So we had a bigger group, unsaved kids. So he's up preaching about the Holy Spirit and his great. And there was three guys who were visiting in the second or third row. And they were, they were goofing off and kind of making fun of the message. And he stops and he goes, and I'll remember this forever. Do you remember that, Camilla? And he, he, he looks at them and he goes, don't make fun of the Holy Spirit. He said, you don't know what God's power is like, but I'm going to show you. And he took, his, he took his, his coat off and he threw it at them. And when it hit them, the three of them went flew over the chair, fell on the floor, and were just shaking under the power of God. They believed in God after that. They were scared, but they believed. But here's a young guy who says, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lock myself away. If God will do it for them, I'm going to wait on God. Now, you and I might not have that kind of time, but we do have some time. Amen? God will honor what we give him for time. So Pentecost reminds us that we need to isolate ourselves in a posture of expectancy. Can you say that with me? Say isolate in a posture of expectancy. You know, some people that, you know, they'll go and they'll pray and they'll lock themselves away and nothing changes because you need expectancy as well. You got to wait in faith. If you're not waiting in faith, if you're not holding fast to the promise of God, you're wasting your time. Well, you'll get something because you're but you're not going to get the fullness of what God wants to do. Amen? Prayer is the thing that places God in his rightful place as a giver and us as receivers. And that's why, I'll say that again. Prayer is the thing that places God in his rightful place as giver and us as receivers. That's why God has set it up that we have to go to him and pray because his nature is to give. And he will not give unless he's asked. So, you know, Jesus says, you have not. Why? Because you... Because God has set up, his nature is to give. He wants to give. And when we come as sons and daughters and say, Father, I really need, he's like, yeah, I get to give again. Yes. And he gives. That's his heart. He's the giver. And so the disciples isolated themselves in the upper room in one accord with a posture of expectancy. And then verse 14, they were all 120, continued in prayer and supplication in one accord, expecting the promise, isolated and waiting for the promise of the Father. And then we know what happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. We'll bring up the verse. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Next verse. 
And suddenly, and it, it's just like that. It's suddenly. How many have ever had a suddenly moment with God? All of a sudden, God is there. I, I remember, and I'm going to tell you because you guys can handle this. I wouldn't share this with just anybody because I think I'm nuts. But I remember, I know you guys are mature to handle this, but I was in my room, laying on my bed, praying, seeking God for a few hours, just praying, just spending time with the Holy Spirit. I had a little, like, nightlight lamp on. Very, it was very dim in the room. And as I'm praying, I'm saying, God, I want you to touch me. I want you to touch me. I just touch my life. Touch my life. And all of a sudden, I, was, I fell asleep. And, I, and all of a sudden, I woke up because my, I had my eyes shut, but it's like light was shining through my eyelids. And I was hoping my, my room was bright, 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 just like the sun. And I was just like, whoa, you know, who changed the light bulbs? What's going on? And all of a sudden, I felt this giant hand. I could feel the fingers one over this shoulder here, here, and feel this over my whole body. And it was like, I know why the Bible says when angels appeared, they said, fear not. Because I was scared. I was like, I felt this amazing warmth, and I felt the presence and the love of God. But I was like, no, go away. That's too much. No, no, pull. Because it, 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 I was scared. It was so much power. I said, no, 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 pull back. And then I, I felt the hand come off, and I said, no, no, come back, come back, come back. And... Because this relationship with God is supposed to be an experience with the power of God. Amen? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And I want to say this because isolation, if you're taking notes, this is important. Isolation in expectation will always lead to visitation. I'm going to say it again. Okay? Okay. Isolation with expectation will always lead to visitation. You have to expect God to show up. Do you know, I talked to John or not. You know what they said about the Toronto report? Do you know why the move of God is still there? Because I keep telling people through advertising and promotion, come, the fire of God is falling here. So people believe it. And they come expecting God to show up. And God keeps showing up. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, if we start advertising at the crossroads, the Holy Spirit's moving and the power of God, and people start hearing that, they come expecting. If we leave this place saying, I don't agree with this, and I don't like the worship, and people, you're not building, you're not, you're not calling on the power. And you know what? I did a study on the Azuzu Street Revival in 1904, and it was a powerful move of God, 1904 to 1906. No, I think it started in 1903. It was three years of power. It was so amazing that people would like, the power of God would fall, and the preacher had an old milk crate, William Seymour, and he would hide under the milk crate because he was afraid because you'd literally have a tangible cloud come down in the service. At the same time, the policemen would run to the front door, and the firemen, and they'd be like, where's the fire? Because the neighbors were calling and saying the building was on fire. And a cloud would fall in that place, and little kids would get up and start to pray for people. And it wasn't uncommon. They'd pray for someone who had rotten teeth, because back in those days, they didn't have dental hygiene like we have. And they'd pray for the teeth, and all new teeth would go poof, come out, and all the dead teeth would fall on the floor. They'd have brand new teeth. Arms would grow back. Legs would grow back. People who were crippled were healed under the power of the manifest presence of God. It went on for three years. And William Seymour had a publication, a newspaper, which I have actually have a, I have a copy in my office there of the, the publications. Honey, can you grab it in the office? I want to show them. It's right in on the, you'll see it. And, and so this was a newspaper that went out monthly to, it was sent all over America, even into Europe. It was mailed out. And it said, come, God is moving. So people would come expecting God to move. And guess what? If you come isolating your time with expectation you'll always have visitation yeah all right so this this was a, a copy of all the the newspapers if any of you want to borrow it or read it i'll let you but this is all the uh you can see here they sent these out every every week and it was all testimony of what god was doing so people came expecting but william seymour um the worship leader was in love with him but he didn't love her. She wanted to marry him. All right. And he, no, I think he married the worship leader. Sorry. But the secretary had, a feeling, had feelings for him. And so she was jealous. So she stole the mailing list. 
So people thought the revival was over, so people stopped coming and the move of God dried up. Talk about messed up. Disunity, right, in the body. But it's amazing how that can happen. So, there's a visitation. Verse 3 of Acts chapter 2. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. One sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right? And so, uh, verse 5 to 6. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitudes came together as they were confused. Now, I think this is very, very interesting because you have an upper room of 120 people that are so loud that people all over the community are coming. What's going on? What's going on? I mean, they must have been loud. Could you imagine the ruckus? And so what I want to do is a, just a little experiment here. I want... Candy and Camilla, come stand up here for a second. All right. Now, I'm going to read this again. They're dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together. They were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So what I want you guys to do is, you know, I want you guys just to talk as loud as you can. All right. You can pray in tongues. You can talk in English. I don't care what language it is. As loud as you can for 20 seconds, okay? All of you, go. Uh, very good. You can stop. That's good. That was awesome. I just heard... All of you guys talking together and glorifying God in English. It was awesome. Did you hear him speaking in English? No, I heard Swedish. You heard Swedish. What did you hear? German. That's what the scripture says. So it was, it was everybody was speaking. So I'm saying that you can be seated. Because the, the miracle wasn't just in the speaking. The miracle was in the hearing. When God said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your young men will dream dreams, your old men will prophesy, or the other way around. He, he was saying all flesh. So when God's spirit was poured out on the 120, the gift of discernment, uh, uh, the gift of interpretation of tongues was falling on all the people around them, and they were hearing in their own language. Them speak the glories of God. If you don't believe me, we'll read on. Let's read on. Verse 12 to 15. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocked, saying, they're full of new wine. They're full of new wine. They're crazy. And you know what? A lot of people believe they were all speaking eloquently in different dialects. I don't believe that. I believe they sounded like this, and they were talking, and the people hearing heard their dialect. But they're, they're, they must be full of new wine. You know, I had a neighbor, and um, I had a window company. He was a, I started a painting division, because he was a really good painter, so I got some painting jobs, and he would come and work for me, and he was drunk. Like, he'd get drunk, drunk, drunk every night. And I thought, man, he, he, but he'd come to work, hung over, and do an amazing job. I don't know what the painters. But he, was, it was, he, he would get drunk, and I would come over there. I remember one day I came over to talk to him, and he came to the door. I said, hey, how's it going? He goes, and he was trying to talk English. And I said, are you okay? And I was like, you got to be kidding. How are you even walking? Normally, you'd pass out before you get that drunk. And he's like, blah, blah, blah. and he followed me, and he's pointing, and he's showing me his cupboards and everything. And he's talking like rubbish because he was so drunk, he didn't make any sense. Anyone know what I'm talking about? And when I read the Bible, I just read it the way it is. I'm not going to, you know, they came, and they didn't say, well, they, uh, they just went to Bible school, and they, learned, they took a language and literature. They're talking frequently in different languages. No, they came and said, they're drunk. Look at the blah, 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 walking around. The Spirit of God overpowered them. Is that okay to say that? This is the way I read it. It's so simple. All right? And Peter said in verse 13, they're, they're, they are full, they're, the others mock saying they're full of new wine. 
And, uh, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Hey, men of Judah who dwell in Jerusalem, you know, let it be known to you, and heed my words, but even though these guys are staggering around and they're not making any sense and they're talking rubbish, uh, you know, gibberish, uh, you know, they're not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. All right? And so they were so empowered, overcome by the power of God, it was affecting their ability to even communicate and to stand, and they were falling down. How many know, how many have ever been filled with the Holy Ghost like that? That's, a, that's called a full immersion of God's spirit. And that's what happened on that day. But I want to say this, okay? Isolation with expectation will always bring visitation. And visitation will always bring the manifestation of God's spirit. The manifestation will always bring revelation. Revelation. Because Peter had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came upon him. And he, he was able to reveal, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. That in that later days, I will pour out my Spirit on all. And he all of a sudden had revelation. Because when you have manifestation, there will always be revelation. Even those that were standing around came and said, we hear, we hear the wonders of God in our own languages. Why? Because when you have manifestation, you have revelation. And everyone's afraid in the church that if the Holy Spirit moves, it's going to offend people and they're going to think it's weird. I'm telling you something. The Spirit of God, when he moves in power, revelation comes always. So say this. Say, isolation with expectation brings what? Visitation, which will always bring forth manifestation. Amen. And Peter begins to expand on the prophet's revelation of Joel. And let's look at what happens in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47. It says, the Lord added to the church, all right, their lives were transformed. And this is the process of power. So basically, revelation brings transformation. If you get revelation from the Holy Spirit, it will transform your life. Everything you've been trying to do on your own, now you won't have to do because the revelation that God will give you in the secret place will give you, it will give you, it will give you the ability to transform into something beautiful. And the lives of people around you will begin to transform. You know, I remember a story um, when I was younger, I came to the Lord and I had all this time on my hands and I would spend hours and hours um, in the presence of God. And I used to be a very an in introvert. I didn't like to hang out with people. And so all my friends would call and say, Hey, you want to go to the movies or you want to go here? You want to, I'd be like, no, no, I I've got an appointment with somebody and I just go and pray. And so I spent lots of time worshiping and praying and soaking up with expectation, the presence of God. And I remember a friend of mine was babysitting. She was babysitting this autistic boy. And I'd come out of my prayer closet and I went and I went over to visit and she was babysitting and I went and sat down and this little boy was just maybe four or five, maybe four. And he ran over and he jumped up and sat on my lap. And my friend, she said, he never does that. He's afraid of men. He's afraid of people, but never mind. Like, you're a man. He doesn't, he's afraid of men. And he would sit on my lap. And so I thought, that's really cool. So I put my hand on him and I just prayed, Lord, fill him up. Put the spirit of God on him. Baptize him. And I remember that. And then I left. And a few days later, she was babysitting again. And so I said, I'm going to go back. So I went back to visit. I sat down. He ran over, jumped on my lap. He took my hand, highly autistic, couldn't even talk, took my hand, put it on his chest, and smiled. And I prayed. Now, the thing is, uh, just prayed. God, touch him, fill him, heal him, whatever. And then he had these big Coke bottle glasses, and he, his, eyes, his eyes would wander. He had, I don't know what you call it, he, lazy eyes. Both of them were going different directions. And... Uh, so anyway, a week or two went by after I had visited, and uh, my friend calls and says, they took him to the hospital. They can't figure out what's wrong. His eyes are straight. His vision is improving. They were like, they were blown away. So I said, well, tell the parents that it's God. So, you know, they went, she told the parents, well, you know, my friend came and was praying, and uh, we believe it's God. And, and they, they were like, I think they were atheists. They were like, ah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's providence. Or like, they just... They didn't believe it. But anyway, the point is, I don't know what happened with that story, but that's just, that's just a, a taste of what can happen when you spend time in the secret place. Amen? 
it begins to come off on other people. All right? So revelation brings transformation. And there's only one thing needed to partake in this baptism. Do you know what it is? Can I tell you? You'll see it. I'll give you just a taste of it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We don't need more knowledge, guys. We need more hunger. We need a, a broken and contrite spirit, a heart that says, God, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. And, and we can get so busy. It's like the seeds that went out and the cares of this world, which represents the weeds of life, come and choke the word. And we get so busy running around. I got to take care of this. I got to take care of that. I got to take care of this. And we spend no time with God. And the cares of this world choke the word of God in our lives. And we didn't have bad hearts. It wasn't that we were like ill-willed or we didn't want to know God. It's just that we didn't isolate ourselves. Everything begins with isolation. It all begins with hunger. And you know what happens? You got to create an appetite by little by little saying, Lord, I'm going to spend a bit of time with you today and talk to him like a friend instead of some, you know, formulated prayer, some distant person you don't know. Talk to him like a friend and let that prayer life begin to grow. Let that isolation time begin to grow. And the isolation, I promise you, if you have expectation, will always bring visitation, which will bring the manifestation of God's spirit that's going to release revelation and then in turn bring transformation. That's the process. And it all starts in isolation. And I think that if we all, including myself, would take time every day, even if it's five minutes, because some of us are busy, I understand, but say, this is my isolated time to say, God, fill me and baptize me fresh with your spirit. I need your life. I need your empowerment. If we take time to do that, and then we all came to church on Sunday, man, the Spirit of God would move so strong in this place. There'd be no telling where we'd go. Amen? So it was kind of a rebuke to me and an encouragement that I can change. And I want to put that challenge out to you guys too, to say, let's make a decision today to say, you know what? God doesn't have to move again on Pentecost because he's already come 2,000 years ago. He's not going to come again. He's here. But here's the deal. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered in chaos. And God spoke, let there be, and the Spirit of God moved. I want to say, the Holy Spirit's the same way today. He hovers in chaos. And he's waiting for the Word of God. And so if you tie yourself in the secret place, and God, your Word says... And I'm holding fast. The Holy Ghost will come in your chaos, in your mess, in your situation. He'll, he'll, come, he'll come in and connect with the word and transform you. And many people say, I can't spend time with God because I feel ashamed. There's sin in my life. No, the Holy Ghost works well in chaos. For in a dark place, a great light has shone in the valley of death and life came forth. So in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your addictions and your problems and your sin issues instead of going into shame and self-pity oh god doesn't let go go boldly into the throne room of grace and obtain mercy because the spirit is hovering in your chaos and is ready to connect with your heart amen amen hallelujah well god is good why don't we stand hallelujah thank you father Father, I just thank you, Lord. If, you, if this message is spoken to you today, just lift your hands. And we'll just say, God, today is a beautiful day. It's when the power of God came upon the church. And we're over 2,000 years past that date. But, God, your spirit is moving the same way today, God. You're hovering over chaos and saying, Lord, just waiting for us to grab hold of your word to come in and to change that situation. So, Lord, we honor you right now. We honor you right now. Father, Holy Spirit, come and touch. Can we finish with that song uh, that I gave you there, the Spirit of the Lord? And uh, let's just finish with this song. And I'm not having an altar call. What I want you to do is right where you are, sing this song. 
and just with expectancy, don't just stand there and sing the words, but with expectancy, draw from the presence of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name.